Thank you all so much for reconvening and doing so so orderly. I'm so glad I'm glad myself. I just finished teaching 150 vampires. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. That, that was the course I was doing with vampires. Uh, but I'm glad to be here now for the second half of the afternoon because uh, I'm already hearing the buzz of the, the first half and dying to see now how this all gets pulled together. It is uh, with great pleasure that I introduce our second speaker for the second half of the afternoon, who is uh, a new, a new uh, uh, acquaintance for me as well. But already I can feel uh, between the camaraderie of my colleague, uh, Audrey Kagan, uh, that already this is going to be a relationship that's going to go on for many years to come. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Maria Carrera, who's a professor of Spanish at Cal State Long Beach, or as we lovingly call it, CISOL. <laughs> uh, uh, her research focuses on heritage language learners, of course, with a concentration in Spanish language learners. Couldn't be more appropriate for our audience here at the University of Texas as well as in the less commonly taught languages. Professor Carriera's most recent work focuses on identity, resilience, and heritage learner development and maintenance, something, again, we are only beginning now to think about of uh, just getting these students into our the flow, if you will, of our usual, whether it's a five, five, three, three, four, four sequence, whatever our sequencing is for languages, how do we maintain their language once we've gotten into the, into the system? She is also co-director of the National Heritage Language Research Center at UCLA, together with Professor Coggin, and the chair of the SAT Spanish Committee, the associate editor of España, and has authored four university-level Spanish textbooks. Textbook in the trenches, I love that. <laughs> Professor Carriera has also received numerous awards, including, quite impressive, being named as the most valuable professor in the College of Liberal Arts. Wow. 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 <laughs> Yeah. Well, hey, we carry, we wear these with honor. We wear these badges with honor. Her talk today, I'm going to go with this title. Is this better than this? Teaching heritage speakers best practices. Something we're all going to learn from. Please help me welcome Professor Maria Carrera. Thank you, Sam, for that wonderful uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, although I have to confess, I'm a little apprehensive. I'll tell you why. Because as I was preparing this talk, I got an email message. There it is. It said it was an offer for a free presentation. <laughs> you can speak any language in just 10 short days, yeah. free from the computer, free from memorization, and absolutely guaranteed. And I, I went out and I looked at that, and it said 30 minutes a day. And I thought, I can't match that. So, uh, But I did think, well, what, what can I offer? How can I distill this message, given that these people are already you know, excelling? What can I do? And I thought, well, maybe. I can come up with a secret and just distill it down to one sentence, and if I have to distill it down to one sentence, it would be, keep your eye on the learner. And, and so that's going to be the overarching theme of the presentation. And um, part one, I'm going to go through very quickly, it will be about knowing the learner. I'm going to go through it very quickly because Olga laid the groundwork. And then part two is, I'm going to spend a considerable amount of time, and in that, those are instructional tools for responding to the needs of the learner. Okay, so know the learner. So typically you ask language teachers what they do, and not surprisingly they say we teach languages, you know, grammar, vocabulary, culture. And, and so at the center of what language teachers do is language, right? There is another view, another way to conceive of this, and that is that we teach human beings, we teach learners. And that involves putting the human being at the very center of things and having the what, the why, and the how revolve around the notion of who are these learners. So those are two contrasting uh, views of what we do. I'm going to call one the what-centered view and the second one the who-centered view. <clears throat> so traditionally, language teaching has been what-centered. And by what center, I mean it's curriculum center. You get your textbook at the beginning of the year, and you say, I'm going to start with this, and I'm going to move to point B, I'm going to move to point C. I've got to spend two weeks in chapter one, because <laughs> there are 14, 14, 15 weeks in the semester, there are seven chapters. You figure it out. You've done this. That's a curriculum center view, and the, the curriculum dictates everything that happens. All right, um, this is what the uh, what center view looks like, typically with L2 learners. So today we're going to teach the past tense. I've got Peter, Paul, and Mary. They've never seen the past tense before in, in this language I'm teaching. Maybe Peter's a little smarter than Mary, but they start out with zero, very little knowledge. Okay? The curriculum center 
your classroom works pretty well when all your dots are lined up, right? Um, and it's not, I don't want to imply that in L2 classes all the dots are lined up. You, know, you got the, the student who never studies and the other one sits uh -huh. in front and asks questions about everything. You've got a wide variety of, of, of students, but relative to what happens when you have heritage language learner, it looks like that. Because they come in knowing next to nothing or nothing about the language, right? So, but what happens if you've got a class with those ducks and this shows up, right? And then also what happens if this one shows up? Then you've got a problem, right? So, one, the question I'm asking, of course, is what happens when you apply a curriculum-centered approach to HL teaching? That's where things start to fall apart, right? So let's go back to Peter, Paul, and Mary, except now we have Maria, Juan, and Pedro. I'm going to teach a past tense. Peter, Paul, and Mary. I, I should have said Pablo, but anyways. Um, we have the past tense. Maria is a first generation um, educated, uh, who's been educated abroad, first generation immigrant educated abroad. Pedro is a first generation immigrant, no education in Spanish, and this happens quite frequently. And Juan is a third generation immigrant, which is to say his grandparents were the first generation to come to the country. So his Spanish is not as fluent as the other two students. Obviously, these students know very different things about the past tense. And, um, and so if you apply the curriculum center view, you're doing what Olga was talking about, right? You're just teaching them, you're going from point zero to point X, you're teaching them all the same thing, and clearly they have different needs, different backgrounds, different strengths. So sort of the curriculum center uh, view of language teaching or approach to language teaching falls apart when you encounter this situation. So, um, I don't know why I got that slide in there. What happens in the curriculum, the, the uh, heritage language classroom, or classrooms enrolling heritage language learners, I should say, resemble something like an orchestra. That um, <coughs> if you have kids that are in a band, uh, you're very familiar with this, right? You have some kids who are very good uh, and very diligent about practicing their instrument. I have a daughter like that who's really good. And then you have other kids, and I have one of those too, who never goes near the instrument, right? Um, and then, uh, you know, you have different instruments in the classroom too. The teacher just takes the students as they are and works with them. And at the end of the semester, or the school year, they produce something. <laughs> some things, sometimes, some concerts are better than others. But that is sort of the view that you have to take of the classroom, when you have heritage language learners involved, we're not going to play the same instrument, number one, different students are going to play different instruments, and we're not going to play them at the same level. Uh, my daughter plays a trumpet in, in band. Well, she's been taking piano for, I don't know, six, seven years, so she's got a lot of uh, musical foundation. Our next door neighbor plays a trumpet. She doesn't even have a trumpet teacher. Those two students go in the classroom, and the teacher has to make it and that's sort of the attitude that we need to take. Incidentally, it doesn't make sense to say that my daughter's taking is in band for, to get an easy A. I, I know what you're talking about, but it's true she's going to have it easier because she has all that background in piano. But there is uh, there's a reason why she's there, and it's not just to, it, primarily to get the A, although she's more likely to get an A uh, than somebody who has no background in music. It's the enjoyment, of it. it's the branching out. And that's what I think we need to tap into. Okay, so why is the learner center view better? <clears throat> because heritage language learners differ from each other with regard to linguistic ability. Olga talked about this. And not just in the HL, but in English, too. The translation course that Olga taught, uh, you said you had native speakers of Russian. I suspect those people were not as strong <coughs> in English. So the task needed people who were strong in English and people who were strong in Russian. Right? So what you can do in English matters. Right? Uh, literacy skills are important too, because if you have good deciphering skills, you can figure things out that you may not know. So if your students come to you with strong literacy skills, if they are good readers, if they're good guessers, if they can get the organizing principles behind an essay, they are already way ahead of the game. If they're not, even if they know the language really well, they're going to be handicapped. 
And this is one of the things you need to know about your students. My students at Cal State Long Beach are very fluent in Spanish. They're typically first, second generation, <coughs> very few third generation. And they've grown up in LA where Spanish is in the air. Right? They're very fluent in Spanish, but they tend to have poor literacy skills. And so when we read a text, even though when I look at the text, oh, they, they don't understand all the words, not so fast. They can't pull it together because they're lacking literacy skills. Frequently, when I give this talk to Arabic teachers, it turns out Arabic students are very advanced when it comes to literacy skills, tend to be very well educated. Russian students tend to be that way too. Maybe you know their, their language skills in their HL are not as advanced as those of Spanish speakers, but you can compensate for that because they have stronger literacy skills. So build on what you have, right? If, if, if uh, fluency is what you have, work on uh, with that. If literacy is what you have, work with that. Effective needs, Olga talked about that. I'm going to talk about that because those are very important. I'm going to move to that uh, soon. Goals for the HL. And of course, if you have a classroom that's mixed, you know when we have this difference between the HL learners, you have differences between the HL learners on the one hand and L2 learners on the other. So uh, diversity is the name of the game, right? So given that the learner, understanding the learner is so important, let's see where we can go, where we can take this idea of the learner, what we can learn about the learner, and what we can do with what we learn about the learner. And I'm going to go very quickly to three things that typically we look at when we talk about the learner. Definitions, Olga already gave them to us. Uh, research on the typical learner, Olga talked about that, and, learn, and research on learner variation. All right, so two, two, two different kinds of definitions, narrow definitions based on proficiency and broad definitions based on affiliation. Notice where I'm, take, where I'm going with this is I want to go from the who to the what. Well, what do we teach? We look at the who, and if we look at the who from the perspective of the definitions are going to teach us. So there's a narrow definition. I believe it's the same definition that Olga gave, and I'm underlining that they have to be to some degree bilingual. So the narrow definition, as Olga said, is based on some measure of proficiency. What that measure is, is unclear. A broad definition doesn't take into account proficiency, but it takes into account, and I underline it, agency in determining whether or not you are a heritage language learner of the heritage language and the heritage culture. So this um, almost, for some students, sometimes I see it as an obsession this preoccupation with what am I? Where do I fit in within this culture? What is my identity? Students who feel that way and who have those, um, those preoccupations, those concerns, those goals, finding themselves through their HL and HC fit the broad definition of heritage language learners, even if they don't fit the narrow definition. So they are some kind of heritage language learner. I mention this because because we teach languages, we think language. We automatically go to language, and we bypass the effective uh, domain. But, oops, but it's good to, <laughs> I want to go there. All right, there. Okay, but it's, it's good to keep in mind that students who fit the narrow definition, your students in mind who speak the language, also fit the broad definition. And what that means is they're also searching for themselves. They're also thinking about questions of identity. They're also trying to figure out where they fit in relative to their community, to other speakers like them. And so we must not forget that while we're targeting ma matters of language, that there's a broader context in which this happens, and that is the effective domain. And I have an example here of a piece of writing that a student of mine from many years ago um, gave to me, which I think kind of shows it all very nicely. And it says, in high school, I was one of very few Latinos. My friend and I were called Mexican kids. This was always so funny to me, because my dad's family always told me that I was American. I was a school, in school, I was labeled Mexican, but to the Mexicans, I'm an American. I'm part of each, but not fully accepted by either. In high school, I was considered Mexican because I spoke Spanish, but I was considered pocho, that's a derogatory term by my dad's family because my Spanish was not up to their standard. It's this weird duality in which you're stuck in the middle. 
Latinos are often told that they're not Americans, but also that they're not connected to their heritage. And now look at the solution this young man came up with. You take pride in both cultures and learn to deal with the rejection. You may never be fully embraced by either side. That's why you seek out other people like yourself. Socializing with people who share a common experience helps you deal with this experience. And that is what the heritage language classroom should try to do. Help these people cope with this duality. And to the extent that language helps them cope with this duality, then we teach language and for whatever other reasons they want to learn the language. But it is this struggle, this where am I, this being between two worlds that brings them, most, more often than not in my experience, brings them to the classroom, to my classroom. All right, so the two definitions give us an orientation as to what we want to be teaching, what do we want to, or how to design a curriculum. There are linguistic needs, and those come from the narrow definition, and then there are affective needs, and those come from the broad definition. So we're starting to get an outline now. By looking at the definitions, we get two general directions for curriculum development. Let's look at now at research on the typical, to fine tune the general idea we just got, let's look at research on the typical learner. Here I'm going to repeat some of what Olga said, so I'm going to go quickly through it. Uh, as Olga mentioned, age of acquisition of English is a big deal when you learn English, and there seem to be two significant ages, four, five, eight, nine, this varies depending on who you're reading. But as Olga mentioned, what really matters is what were you learning up to in the first years of life? If you were learning your HL exclusively, then you got all the things that normal kids get in their first years of life. You got the home vocabulary. You got the syntactic structures that, that, that kids learn, the pragmatic, pragmatics that kids learn in the early years of life, right? Now, you start, if you, all of a sudden you start school and you start learning English, what happens is you are, you're, you're sharing, your, unif your universe all of a sudden becomes bilingual. So you input to the heritage language is cut back. Why? Because half the day or three quarters of the day, whatever it works out to be, you're hearing English. All of a sudden, you're not getting all the input that a native speaking kid would get. So that's why it's so important, this age notion. When, it's really not so much when did you start to learn English, but when did the input to your HL become diminished? And, and so the critical junctures um, one is when you start school, most kids, when they start school, start learning English, and then at that point, input to their HL is diminished, right? Obvious, and then later on, later in life, we know around eight, eight, age eight, nine, even later, kids are still learning their language. So if input is diminished at that age, you're not getting what, you're not getting the kind of input, the kind of exposure that kids are getting their native language. So obviously you're gonna have those holes that Olga was talking about. Uh, the order of acquisition of the language is significant for the same reason. If you learn Spanish first, at least we know that for the first five years, you got the same as what a native kid gets. So we can kind of predict what kinds of things you're gonna be good at. The kinds of things that kids that learn Spanish up to age five, so use Spanish as an example, will learn. Right? If you learn both languages at the same time, then from day one, you're not getting full, the full range of input to your HL. Schooling is also very important. Um, Olga mentioned Sylvina Montrul at the University of Illinois. She has found that school gives you input to complex structures that you don't get or are not as frequent in the oral language. You read them, you have subordination. In Spanish, you have heavy use of the subjunctive. In the, um, in the written language. Um, in, in, in the spoken language, you don't get as much of that. So if you don't go to school and you never read you know, academic essays or pieces of literature, then you're not getting as much input, so you're not going to know those structures, uh, those forms very well. And of course, it's all about exposure. So if you, if you travel abroad a lot, and, and in our study we found that a lot of students, especially Spanish-speaking students, travel to their native country a lot. Not Cubans, but Mexicans, certainly in California, and I would imagine here, do that's good. If you watch TV in your AHL, you listen to music, whatever it is that gives you added exposure, you go to church, that's good. 
So what do we learn from our survey? As Olga mentioned, most of our learners have used their HL exclusively until age five when they start school. That's positive. And that tells us that they're gonna know what five-year-old kids know. Has visited their country of origin once or twice, listens to music, that's mostly watches soap operas in Spanish, those are really big, <laughs> attends religious services in their HL, but they don't do much reading. So most of it is positive. The lack of reading, of course, is negative for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Little or no schooling in the HL. U.S. born is sometimes a factor, but only because it correlates with not getting that much input. So what are their linguistic strengths and, and, and needs? They have some, same some facility, in, in some cases quite considerable uh, a level of facility in informal language, spoken language. They tend to have low literacy skills, particularly limited command of things that you get in school, which is embedding compound sentences, the academic registers. Again, since they have, don't have schooling, they're going to be deficient in these areas. So uh, grammar areas in need of attention are those learned after age five, typically. In Spanish, they are aspect, the subjunctive, the perfect verb forms. All right, so notice we went from the who to the what, and now we have curricular emphasis. Language features acquired after age five, linguistic skills acquired through schooling. We also have the why. And Again, going back to the data that Olga presented earlier, we see that they have positive associations. They also have some insecurities. They see themselves as hyphenated Americans, so they live between two worlds. They want to learn about their roots. They want to connect with other members of their community. They enjoy using their language to help others. This came up time <coughs> and time again. We asked them to relate an anecdote. And the most common type of anecdote that we got was, oh, there was this new kid in school and I was able to help them. Or my neighbor needed help talking, you know, getting some assistance from the phone company and I was able to step in. They derive enormous pleasure out of that. Uh, and in, for some languages, they would like to take professional advantage of their heritage language skills. So this gives us a socio-affective orient a social affective orientation to the curriculum. You want to respond to their affective needs. Remember from the broad definition, this desire to explore issues of identity. You want to build on positive associations. They like to help others. Maybe think about building into your projects things that involve connecting with others, helping others. And think about combating negative associations because they do get a lot of negative comments directed at them. Um, respond to their social needs and, and for particular language languages respond to their professional goals. So now we're moving on to the how. Right? Oops. Well, I skipped it, not an important slide. To look at the how, I am going to present research on learner variation, in particular variation in the class. And once again, I'm going to draw on this survey that we conducted. The survey, by the way, is available. We have a very extensive paper on the, on the results of the survey on the Heritage Language, um, National Heritage Language Resource Center webpage. And Olga passed out those, um, uh, the only word that's coming to me right now is in Spanish. For I don't know why I'm stuck, but the <laughs> Spanish. <laughs> um, and and you, so you can access it uh, from our webpage. So um, we found that heritage languages, by and large, are taught in one or two or three, depending on how you define it, contexts. One is a one-track program where you mix heritage language learners and um, HL learners in the same class. And I think at the beginning, when, when Olga asked about this, I got the sense that most of you find yourselves teaching in that context. Is that is that right? Can I see a show of hands of people who teach in one-track programs? Oh, okay. <laughs> and then we found that there are dual-track programs. Typically, the most common configuration is only one HL course. We'll see the problem with that in a second. Uh, in some cases, you get two HL courses. Okay. Whoops. All right. So with this survey, one of the things we were able to do is to sort of enter a class and look at the students, measure the range of variation within a given class, all right? 
So far, it says we have, we looked at Japanese 300, which is a mixed class with L2 learners and HL learners. Uh, it has a third year college, of course, 16 students, 12 HL learners, four L2 learners. The HL learners all have intermediate to advanced oral skills, have, eight had three or more years of schooling, four had one to two years of schooling, and the L2 learners all have taken four semesters of Japanese. So that's the general profile of the class. So what we see in this class is, is there's variation between HL learners, some have more schooling than others, and between HL learners and L2 learners. All right. Now let's move to a little bit more challenging class, and this is Arabic. Um, before I, I give you the uh, composition of the Arabic class, let me just mention diglossia. Uh, are you guys aware of what diglossia is? Arabic has two forms of language. The high prestige <coughs> form, which is used in formal situations, it's written, it's known by educated speakers, and it functions as a <coughs> lingua franca among Arabs from different countries. And then it has colloquial Arabic, which is low prestige, it's a home language, it's informal, it's not commonly written, and most significantly, because I'm going to get to this, is mutually unintelligible from one region to the next. Obviously, regions that are contiguous understand each other, but if you skip a few areas, a few countries, the intelligibility goes down. Okay? So, look at Arabic 100. With that in mind, look at Arabic 100. Arabic 100 had 11 students from six Arab countries. Syria, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Morocco, and Egypt. And one student from Indonesia who was a Muslim, his knowledge of Arabic came from reading the Quran. All right? Two have four more years of education abroad. Three have three years of religious education in, in Arabic in the U.S. And the rest have no literacy skills in Arabic. Okay. So in air, in, in the variation in Arabic is much more complex, as you can see, right? We have variation between HL learners, different levels of preparedness, and fluency, uh, literacy. But we have different dialects represented, and we have this diglossic situation. Students come to class with command of an oral language, a colloquial language, and we're teaching them something that is a standard. You can see that all of a sudden, you know, I, I bring this up because typically people go, oh, if I only had HL classes, things would be solved for me. Not really, right? I'd rather be teaching, if I could, I'd rather be teaching Japanese 100 <laughs> than Arabic 100, right? And I'd much rather be teaching Arabic 100 than... Hindi 100. <laughs> this is Hindi 100 for HL learners. And what do we have in Hindi 100? Well, before I tell you what we have, let me tell you what India is like. And you probably know this already. Hindi is the official language of the country, but individual states have their own official languages. There are 29 languages, 29, that have over a million speakers. All right? There are many more than 29 languages, but 29 with more than a million speakers, right? And they stem primarily from two language families. Okay, so they're not all related, right? You have Indo-Aryan in the north and Dravidian in the south, and many languages have their own writing system. Okay? So, Hindi 100 has 16 students from five different language backgrounds. Some of these languages are not related to each other. It's like putting a Basque person in a Spanish for native speakers class. And, you know, the culture is there, but that's about it. Okay? So some of these languages are not related, right? So um, but variation here is dialectal, cross-linguistic, in addition to between learners, right? So <clears throat> which scenario all of a sudden seems more challenging? The HL class scenario or the HL L2 class scenario? The HL, right? How does this problem arise in this case? Well, let's have a look. In the Arabic and Hindi programs, HL classes are seen as a catch all. Oh, you're not Anglo? You're going over there, right? <laughs> so you're just throwing everything in there, things that don't go together. 
right? Arabic and Hindi, Hindi 100 do not make linguistic sense. So if you're going to have an HL class, it needs to make linguistic sense. It can't be defined in, in, in place of being an L2, whatever in the negative, right? Whatever isn't an L2 learner goes into the HL class because you create this kind of mess. Uh, so what does a study of learner variation tell us? That all classes, regardless of whether they're HL classes or mixed classes, if they enroll HL learners, you have classes that are highly heterogeneous, right? By that I mean that they have students with different skills, goals, backgrounds in the HL. So the question is, how do you deal with learner variation? All right, let's start out with what not to do. I was thinking, do you guys ever watch the show What Not to Wear? <laughs> that's what I have. Yeah, for some reason, that's what came to mind. What not to do. All right. So don't ignore diversity. By that, I mean don't exclude learners who don't fit the model. We do this in my university, I'm ashamed to say. In my department, nobody's ever done a study of this, but in, in Southern California, my guess is in my department, 80% of students are heritage speakers of Spanish. Right? but a small percentage of our classes are for heritage speakers. And once we take them on, once they go through that, once they go through the heritage classes, we have two, two levels, then they move into the regular track. And they're supposed to blend in with the, the few that aren't heritage. They're supposed to behave like L2 learners. So we're kind of ignoring the fact that they're different. Right? We just ignore it and we just keep going our merry old way as if we were teaching Spanish in northern Minnesota 30 years ago. <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, another problem is to enforce the paradigm or the status quo at all costs. Like, by that I mean don't force all learners to conform to the model that you have of your language. And you know, you see this in Arabic and Hindi. Just you're gonna go in there. I don't care if you don't fit, you're going in there and you're gonna do what we're doing in there, it doesn't matter what your makeup is. Okay, so let's look at the do. Well, at the program level, you have to think about how to mitigate problems of diversity. And um, you, know, you do that through smart curriculum design and placement. Creating an HL class doesn't solve the problem. You've gotta create a smart HL class, one that makes linguistic and demographic sense, right? They can use placement to build maximally homogeneous classes with the understanding that placement can only get you so far. No matter what you do, you will end up with a heterogeneous class. No question about it. Because typically, if you only have one HL class, or even if you have two, you're not going to be able to fit people perfectly into the class, let alone having a mix, mix classes, right? So you have to accept diversity and somehow Figure out a way to teach to different levels, different types of students in the same class. And that brings me to part two of the talk, and that is the instructional tools. What kinds of instructional tools help us reach different student populations at once? <clears throat> so let's, let's see where we are right now. We started out with the not so good, which means you got the book, you got the curriculum, it's fixed and uh, everybody does the same thing. That's not good because if you have heritage language students, you're not catering to their needs. They have very different needs, so they don't all need to follow the same steps. A better way to do it is to think about what your typical learner looks like. And you can use the research that we presented, and you say, well, I'm gonna design a class around this typical learner. That's better than the not so good. Right? Because now at least you have a typical learner. The problem is that the typical learner is an abstraction. And you're going to have real learners who will fit the definition of typical learner with regard to some things, but not with regard to others. So you leave them out if you stop at that point, at the yellow. Right? So what is the best you could do is you start with a curriculum that targets the typical learner, but is flexible enough, builds in tools, has tools, that make it flexible enough to respond to the needs of all learners. This is called differentiated instruction. And I'm going to warn you, I'm going to give you, um, I don't know how much time I have, you know, whatever I have, 35 minute introduction to it. 
it's a whole field. If you go to the School of Education, you can spend years studying differentiated instruction. I'm only going to give you 35 minutes, okay? Um, so, uh, but I invite you to, to look into it because it's a very promising uh, field, in my opinion, for heritage language teaching. So, um, Tom, uh, Tomlinson sum, uh, is summarizing the heritage language teaching. The differentiated teaching is about in this way. In differentiated classrooms, teachers begin where students are, not the front of a curriculum. They accept and build upon the premise that learners differ in important ways. In differentiated classrooms, teachers provide specific ways for each individual to learn as deeply as possible and as quickly as possible without assuming one student's roadmap for learning is identical to anyone else's. Sounds good. I know what you're thinking because I thought it. Uh, it sounds good, but who are you kidding? This isn't real. Okay. Well, let's see. Before we examine whether it's possible to do it or not, let's talk about what can you differentiate? Well, you can differentiate content, and that is the material, the actual stuff you're studying. Process, how you gain mastery of the material, right? Product, how you demonstrate mastery of the material. Typically, it's like an exam in a language class, but it could be a project, right? And pacing, how quickly you gain mastery. So all these things you can vary. You can differentiate all these things, right? And you can differentiate according to students' readiness, level of readiness to do work, weaknesses and strengths, interests, effective needs, learning profile, you know, whether they're oral learners or visual learners. Okay, so here we go. You're thinking, yeah, it sounds great, but forget it. I, you know, I just can't manage this, and life is hard enough as it is. Well, and you might be saying to yourself, any of these things, right? Oh, it's too much work. Well, actually, I've been doing this for a long time. When done right, differentiation actually decreases the amount of work done by the instructor. But the key here is done right. If you don't do it right, you will die. <laughs> okay? So I'm serious. <laughs> all right. Um, you might be thinking, okay, all right, but what am I? Psychic? Now I've got 30 students and I'm supposed to be talking about what everybody's doing and know everything? Um, well, <clears throat> if you use this thing I'm going to talk about at the end, ongoing assessment, formative assessment, you can really know pretty well how your students are doing any day of the week. And it's amazing, and I'm going to show you how to do it in a very easy way. And another objection you might have is, oh, if everybody's doing something different, how do I keep track of students' work and progress? And um, I worried about this for about five minutes when I first heard about it, because I have been helping when my daughter, I started doing this when my youngest daughter was in kindergarten, and I have been helping one day a week. And I became very interested in the fact that these little people, five-year-olds, I'll know what they were supposed to do. No, I'm going to the center to study while the teacher is doing that, and I'm going to be doing in the reading corner. And I figure, my goodness, if a classroom with five-year-olds, if a student, a teacher can keep track of what five-year-olds are doing, I think I can do it with 20-some-year-olds, you know, 19 to 20-some-year-olds, right? So the key is to hold the students accountable or keeping track of what they're doing. And that's exactly what the five-year-olds can do. They know what they're supposed to be doing and what's going to be expected of them at the end of the day or at the end of the 15-minute period. And that's what your undergraduates need to be doing to do too. <laughs> and then the final question is, now I've got to throw everything out and start over? No, not at all. Many of the things you're already doing in your classroom are actually strategies for differentiation. It's a matter of how you use it, what you do with what you have. All right, so the key when dealing with these concerns is to teach a routine, to know what to differentiate, knowing when to differentiate, and knowing how to differentiate. So I'm going to go into each one of these now. So teaching the routine, we travel today very early in the morning. If you've been through an airport, you know how incredibly complex it is to get through an airport. There was a woman behind me uh, today who had obviously never flown before. She was a Spanish speaker. And her son was trying to tell her right before you know, she went through security. Well, when, you know, you're going to go to security, take your shoes up, put this here, then go there. And, and she was really confused. She'd never flown before. She didn't know the routine. And if you don't know the routine, it's an incredibly complicated thing, right? If you know the routine, it's a ballet. It's a work of art. 
right? I mean, I always fly with a pocket. I, I have shoes that I can slip on and off. You know, I know exactly how many bins I need. I mean, you've got to, if you're a frequent flyer, you know what you're doing. And lots of people nowadays know what they're doing. And that's why the system functions so well, most of the time, really. I mean, they get a lot of people through security, and it functions because we all know what we have to do. And if there's a lady with a kid, you help out. Everybody is on target, right? <laughs> so that's what it's about. Teaching the routine, insist on shared responsibility and preparedness in anticipating problems. Okay, um, uh, my flight is now delayed. What do I, how do I deal with delayed flights? You anticipate so when the problems come up, you have a plan ahead of time. So if you look at the literature on differentiated teaching, teachers were typically, if you're working on a project, they give a, a scenario. There are three of you working really hard and there's this one who never does what he's supposed to do. How do you deal with this? And you prearrange how you're going to deal with it. This will likely make it so that people who plan on doing that won't do it so much because now you know you're on, they know you're on to them. But also the students who are doing the work have a plan for dealing with the situation, right? Oops. Moving on to knowing what to differentiate. <clears throat> Remember I told you you can differentiate content, which is the material, process, which is how you learn the material, product, how you Demonst uh, how you demonstrate mastery of the material and pace, how quickly, the pace at which you learn the material. Well, typically in, in our classes, content tends to be fixed to some extent, right? What you need to do, that the content typically can't be manipulated as much. Although, it's a good idea to think, what is it that I want everybody to know at the end of this semester? And that's the fixed content, right? That's not open, sorry, that's not open to negotiation, right? But the way you differentiate what's fixed in terms of content is by varying the process and varying the pace or the product. There are other things, however, that may not be so fixed. You might think, well, everybody's got to know this, but not really. <coughs> Those things you might think, bless you, uh, about differentiating. So this is a good way to think about it. Enduring knowledge. And this is the stuff that everybody's got to walk away with at the end of the semester. This is instructor selected because you know what they're going to need to know in order when they move on to the next level, right? So that's fixed. There you differentiate the pacing, the process, the product. Then there's some content that you can negotiate. Oh, okay, so you're interested in learning medical vocabulary in your profession. Well, let's, let me substitute this for that because that is of particular interest. To you. And then there's stuff that's worth being familiar with. And those you can allow your students to um, pick up for themselves. Now, knowing when to differentiate, well, don't differentiate all the time. That's not, this is not parallel play. You know, children start out doing only parallel play. You go into a Montessori room and everybody's playing, but they're all playing by themselves in a parallel fashion. But you shouldn't conceive of the classroom that way. You differentiate when it's necessary to achieve your, with your goals, but you bring the classroom together most of the time. Because if you differentiate all the time, you don't have a classroom anymore. It's like dinner at a friend's house I have where everybody eats, walks in, and eats at a different time. You know, they no longer have meals, right? You want to think of the classroom as a meal time, and you want to bring people together, and then within that, within those constraints, allow some differentiation. And then the crux of the issue, master a small number of instructional tools. And I'm going to go through each of these now, one by one. So first, flexible grouping. I'm going to talk about grouping strategies and types of groups. So chance and proximity is in red. These are all the different strategies you can use to group your students. Chance and proximity are in red because typically that's what we do, right? The two of you are sitting next to each other. You're going to work on this problem together. You know, you two, that's how we do it. I had a teacher once, I was giving this talk, and he was saying, I don't do it that way. What I do is, anybody who's wearing shoes with white laces goes with shoes with black laces. Well, that's it's the same thing, right? <laughs> really, you want to take advantage of grouping to maximize <coughs> results. I'm going to talk about, in this case, I'm just going to illustrate how to group by ability. 
uh, as well as by HLL2 status at the bottom. And I'm going to start out with that, I think, if I remember. Yes, learning partners. So learning partners, you have two, right? All right. There's been some very interesting study just recently. Some of the stuff is in press. The other one is from this year. It just came out of the Heritage Language uh, Journal this year. What Melissa Bowles did was, you know, the old information gap activity. She had, she paired, matched for, for uh, proficiency, she paired HL students with L2 students. They each had a picture that was slightly different, right? And they had to talk about their differences. You know, it's a typical activity. And you arrive at, you try to figure out with questions what the differences are. You're familiar with this kind of activity, right? In the first, uh, um, in the first one she did, the one up here, which hasn't been, it hasn't come out yet, but it was the first study, the pictures were of a, of a kitchen, and it was all oral. What did she find? That L2 learners benefited more from this activity than HL learners. And by benefited more, uh, she talked, she means that they, they were able to correct themselves. They learned more from this activity than the L2 learners. So then she went back and she did this study again, and again, it was a picture an information gap activity, but now it wasn't a kitchen. Now it was more general vocabulary. And there was an oral component, but there was also a written component where they had to write uh, a little essay at the end, a little, kind of, a little paragraph, and what they had found. This time around, both types of learners benefited from the activity. So what's the difference? <clears throat> well, the material she used and the task that she used. Material in the first task where they didn't benefit, where the HL learners didn't benefit, it was home vocabulary. It was the kitchen. Guess what? They already know this, right? But it turns out the L2 learners don't know kitchen vocabulary, right? So they're getting, they're learning a lot from the HL learners, right? And then it was all oral. Well, the HL learners excel at oral language. So if it's talking, it's the L2 learners who are benefit. Oh, that's how you say it, you know? But the HL learners, for them, is stuff they already know. In the second uh, task, in the second study she did, it was more general vocabulary. Now the HLs didn't have the upper hand. Now they stood to benefit, both <laughs> learners stood to benefit, from negotiating input, right? And it was written. So guess what? The HL learners benefited when it came to writing, they would ask the L2 learners, does this word have an accent, or how do you spell this? So they drew on the expertise of the L2 learners. And what did the HL learners, um, and what did the L2 learners learn? Well, in the oral task, they were able to benefit from the fluidity of, um, of um, L HL learners. So what's, what, what do we learn from this? If you're going to pair HL and L2 learners, you want to take advantage of complementary strengths and have the learners, the HL learners, work on what they're weak on because that is typically what the L2 learners are strong on. So have them write, do the writing with the assistance of the L2 learners and have the L2 learners work on what requires oral proficiency, fluency, quick use of language on their feet because the L2 learners need to practice that and the HL learners can help them practice. And of course, you want to hold both students accountable. So let me give you an example of how to do this from Spanish. I apologize. But Spanish has these two uh, verb, two past tenses. One is the preterite, and one is the imperfect. It's asking this an aspectual difference in the past. And uh, we practice that a lot because it, it's very difficult. But drawing on what Melissa Bowl did, you could have them fill in the blanks, working in HL, L2 pairings, fill in the blank. One of them is going to say it. What's the word that goes in there? Is it going to be preterite or imperfect? The other one's going to write it. Now, thinking about Melissa Bowles findings, who do you think should say it? The L2 learner, right? And then who should write it? The HL learner, right? So this is a way to think about using the activities that you already have. How do you adapt them for HL L2 pairings? All right. Let's go to small groups, um, and later I will talk about half class. Small groups, are you familiar with the jigsaw sequence? Jigsaw sequence, sequence involves forming groups of three, four, five, whatever. 
Um, but typically, it's a mixed ability rule. Okay, so one I'm going to use to denote the lowest proficiency students, and four the highest proficiency students. So you somehow mix students at different levels of proficiency. All right. Then the home base group breaks up into an expert group. And all the ones now come together, all the twos are together, all the threes are together, all the four are together. They work on a task, and then they return to the home base group. And they report their findings to the home base group. Let's see specifically how we can get that to work. Are you familiar with Bloom's taxonomy? Essentially, it's a hierarchy of activities or tasks that go from simplest cognitively speaking, here, to most difficult. So you can see that knowledge involves memorizing verbatim information, being able to remember, but not necessarily fully understanding the material. A level up is comprehension, which involves restating in your own words, paraphrasing, summarizing, translating. And a uh, level, uh, level up from there is application, which involves using information to solve problems, transferring abstract or theoretical ideas to practical situations. Analysis, identifying components, arrangement, logic and semantics, synthesis, combining information to form a unique product, and evaluation typically involves evaluating something, arguing one of two or two points of view. <clears throat> All right, so what can we do? Whoops, not very logical. We can have the ones do the knowledge or comprehension questions. Remember, those are at the bottom of the hierarchy. Typically, you read, a, you have a selection, and if you have a textbook, you read something. It's the questions, the comprehension questions that follow. Those are at the knowledge or comprehension level. You can ask the tools to design a graphic organizer of the material. If it's a history lesson, for example, they might put it on a chronological line. If it's about a family, they might draw a family tree. You can do a Venn diagram, etc. Um, you can ask three to compare two texts. Last, last chapter we looked at this, now this chapter we're looking at this. How do the text, what are they, how are they similar, how are they different? That's a level up. And finally, uh, for the fours, the most advanced students, you can ask them to re react to the text or rewrite the text. Let's go through this together so you'll get a more concrete idea. All right, so you ask a student to translate into English all or part of the text. What level? What level do you think? One, two, three, or four? You think it's a one into English? You're going into English? Is that a pretty simple? All right. So that's one way. One thing you can do for one. What about a close activity for part of the test? Where there are words missing, that's a close activity. You take a text, you delete, you can do every fifth word, you can do tactical, you can delete tactical items that they have to fill in. What level do you think that is? One, two, three, or four? Actually, I, let me show you a technique. I could ask you all to raise your hand and show me what you think it is. So, at the count of three, one, two, three, or four? One, two, three. So this is a quick way to do an oral. It depends on how you do it, but you can see it's higher than one. Right? It could be a three. It could even be a four. Right. It depends on how you do it. What about reducing the text? So you've got a 250 word text and you're saying bring it down to 50 words. Now, now that involves analysis, right? You gotta figure out what, what, how it's held together, how it's organized, right? What about expanding the text? Now you're adding information to the text. So do you have a 200, I, typically I ask students to do that. I'll say, okay, this is a four paragraph text. I want you to add a sentence to each paragraph. Now, they not only have to understand how it's organized, but they have to produce something original. You can see, I saw fours, yeah. You can see that's a four activity. What about summarizing the information in your own words? Yeah. It could be a three, right? It could be a three, right? Notice that's different from reducing. Reducing is using the words that are in the text. That's an easier activity than summarizing where you have to use your own words. What about representing the information? A one? Yeah, it's an easy, right. Um, Another thing sometimes I ask my students to do is there's a text, and I say, now you go online and decorate this text. Find me charts that go with what is being presented here. Find me maps, find me pictures. You know, fill it in, make it look really nice. Write a caption for a picture that you find. 
it's not a super difficult task, but it does involve analyzing what's there, right? I don't know, what, what level do you think you would put that at? It depends, right? But if it's one or two, right? So you can see uh, answer inference and opinion questions. Well, that's hard. That's hard. Right. And rewrite the ending. That's very hard. So you can see that you can come up with activities at many different levels so that you can adjust to these expert groups. But notice that the key idea, a really important idea is, don't conceptualize this as giving the easy stuff to one and the interesting and hard stuff to four. What you want to do is advance enduring knowledge with all of the expert groups. Right? So advance the knowledge, remember the picture, um, that's the idea. Advance the core knowledge that everybody must know with all of the activities in one way or another. Right? Um, I guess it's, yeah. And then what is important to know and worth knowing can be differentiated according to the level of the student. But each activity for each group must be important to the whole class. Otherwise people catch on and they go, we don't have to listen to the ones. They don't have anything to give to the force. So that's the trick when you construct this kind of activity. All right, let's look at centers. Centers are just resource centers. In my, my daughter's classroom, when she was in kindergarten, it was a physical location in the room. In college, we don't have a room, right? So I have virtual centers. And centers have resources, exercises, explanations, tools, uh, sample writings, for example, when your students are writing. So cent uh, centers allow you to vary the process, how you gain mastery of the material, because you know you might want to consult 10 things if you feel you're struggling with the material, and somebody else may not need to go to the center to vary the process there. Increase access and support independent learning. Right? How I use centers, I have Blackboard, and I have, because I've been doing this for many, many years, oh, I, I'm not kidding, 50, 60 activities that they can do. They can just go there and they can repeat them as many times as they want to. They'll just practice rote activities for practicing spelling, conjugation. You know. But they can go in there and get ideas and, and, and practice and then they'll get feedback on what they're doing wrong and then they try another exercise, um, etc. The work is done independently by student and it's self-paced. I'll put up these activities for two to three weeks. And during that time, they can enter the center and go back as many times as they want to and do the same activity as many times as they want to. Moving on to agendas and contracts. Um, agendas are used to vary the pace, remember that's how quickly you move through things, and the product, how you demonstrate uh, mastery of the, of, of the material. And they support self-directed learning and effective classroom management. So we, we've done our, our agendas already. Let's look at contracts. These are not very common in, in foreign language teaching, but they are very common in other areas. And that's an agreement between the teacher and the student, right? So by the end of the fourth week, you're going to produce a composition. You're going to do exercises five, six, and seven. You're going to do a presentation. And you agree together what the student will have to complete and on what basis, how, uh, to, to get the grade that the student uh, wants to get. Now, I use this to vary the process. Okay, so it's going to take you, you know, I, you have problems with the and the imperfect. Maybe I'm going to ask you to do four exercises. So that's varying the process. And I use it to vary the product. Oh, you'd rather write a short story? You go ahead and write a short story. You'd rather interview your grandmother? You go ahead and interview your grandmother. But students have different ways of showing me how, that they have acquired the material that I consider to be part of enduring So sample agenda. Agendas are a good idea with heritage languages. I don't give, and I learned this from my, my daughter's class too, I don't give assignments from one day to the next. I give assignments two, week at a, two weeks at a time. So I'll say, you know, in November 2nd, you have to turn in and there'll be something like 10 or 15 exercises. And then the fast students, the ones who know what they're doing and don't have problems, can go through them very quickly. The students who are struggling, who need extra help, can use that time to get the extra help to go to the center multiple times, to come see me multiple times, etc. All right. Frequently I'm asked, well, what about having different agendas for different students? Typically, I don't have, I have one agenda for the entire class, and what I do is I vary the pace. 
Having an agenda makes it possible for some students to do it very quickly, some students to take their time and get the help that they need. It is possible to have different agendas for different students, but it takes a lot of work. You have to really think hard about how to do this. And the best recommendation I can give you if you're interested in doing that is to think in terms of enduring knowledge again. What is it that everybody must be able to do at the end of the semester or at the end of this unit? And then you build three or four agendas around students who know how to write, but are problems being fluid, they're going to do these exercises. Students who are fluid but don't know how to write are going to concentrate on these exercises. So you build the agenda around those, those elements that involve enduring knowledge. Again, the agenda can't be one where advanced students are not going to bother with this, and the struggling students are going to do this at a very low level. Well, everybody advances to the next level. The question is, what do you need to do to get to, uh, to the next level? And the real trick a lot of times, well, is knowing students, but also equalizing the workload, which can be tricky, right? Typically, you want to give the advanced students less work than the other ones. Moving on to templates, um, they vary instruction according to students' interests and effective needs, and they also hold students accountable for their own learning. Those are the two yeah, and main properties of templates. I'm going to start with the second one. Like they hold students accountable for their own learning. And I'm going to use what's called a constructivist grammar activity. You can find that out. Those two articles, no, it's one article from 2006, which explains it very nicely. But here's the gist of it. And here's, here's an example of it. So Spanish has these little words, me, tu, te, se, de, mas, siguen. So they take an accent. When they mean one thing, so me, for example, takes an accent when it means me, but it doesn't take an accent when it means my, right? You takes an accent when it means you do, it takes an accent when it means you, but not when it means you. So I used to, when I, you know, years ago, I would say, okay, let's go through the rules. That's boring. What do I do now? The day I'm going to do this activity, I say, bring in a newspaper, a book, whatever you have, a magazine, bring it into class. Work in big groups and look at the sentences. Find sentences all over these magazines, jot them down, and from these sentences, you deduce which of the two meanings takes an accent. Now I'm holding them accountable, right? If they find a sentence where two means you and they see that there it takes an accent, they go, oh, the two, one, the two, uh, the two meanings, this is the one that takes an accent. They did the work themselves, number one. And number two, in the process of doing the work, they're looking, they're gaining input. Remember, you want, uh, HL learners need, a, need exposure. That's what this activity buys them. I suspect they're also more likely to remember the meetings having done the work themselves. All right, I said that um, templates, the second feature of templates I was going to get to was that they facilitate the exploration of effective issues. And remember from the broad definition, this is really important for heritage language learners. They come not just wanting to learn language, but trying to figure out where they fit in relative to this culture, who they are, okay? So templates are very good for that. And I'm going to focus on two similar templates. One is the dialectal journal. The dialectal journal involves, you have a reading in class, you ask the students to pick out a passage, a main idea, an important event, whatever, a character, whatever you want to put in there. Pick out something that jumped out at them and then react to it. Explain why you found it interesting, whether you like it or not, etc. Guess what's going to happen? The Heri this is a place where the heritage language learners will find something that is culturally meaningful or, or relates to these hot topics, identity effective topics that they come to class for. They'll jot it down and they'll react to it. And that gives you, when you get that, it gives you an opportunity to bring it up in class. Or it gives you an insight into what it is they're thinking, what it is that's bringing them and keeping their interest in class. A similar, um, somewhat similar task is a text to self connections. You ask students to pick out a passage from the text and ask them to say what this reminds them of. A passage mm -hmm. from the text, whether you agree or disagree with it. A passage from the text and what you find it interesting, they're reacting. And again, this is a good way to explore those issues that heritage language learners are so interested in, right? I was thinking, is that for something else I'm preparing, I was thinking, you know, even you can do it with all sorts of readings, even something like Little Red Riding Hood. I was thinking, what can I do with Little Red Riding Hood? 
Uh, well, you know, what jumped out of me as I was thinking of Little Red Riding Hood is that in Latin culture, the grandmother would never be far away from the uh, <laughs> from Little Red Riding Hood, right? So she would never have to walk, she would never be alone for someone to walk through in the woods alone, but it would be grandma upstairs, right? That just wouldn't, wouldn't happen. So these are the kinds of things you can bring up, and that engages them in talking about their culture. <clears throat> All right, and finally, activities to review the material. Uh, these are, I'm going to focus on two that I really like. The exit card, I do this almost every time we meet. I tell them at the beginning of the semester, buy three by five cards, okay? And they walk around with a pack of three by five cards. And I'll say, okay, the last 10 minutes of class, take out your exit card now, and I can bury this, right? An aha moment for you in today's lesson. And they describe what happens. I will say, tell me something that remains unclear. I guess what? I go home and I look at it. Oh my God, I got to review that. That is certainly not. That's a problem, right? I can ask them to compare and contrast to check for understanding, right? I, I can ask them, did you have any problems? Sometimes you know, we broach topics that are a little difficult, emotionally difficult. I say, write it down. So I use the exit card to learn what they're thinking and to adjust my, my, my classes to their needs as I see them, or as they express them in the exit card. The sum it up card is something that I use at the end of every chapter, all right? Now, heritage language learners come to class knowing a lot, typically, about the material. And as Olga mentioned, you know, you get caught up on, I already know this. So you stop looking for what it is that you don't know. So if I'm teaching them something, I always start out with that. I, what I already do and what I could already do. What I already knew and what I could already do. And I ask them to think about that. And I say, you're not here for that. Obviously, you're not coming to class to learn something you can you already know about, right? I want you to think about the new pieces here that are going to add to what you know already. So then at the end of the unit, they fill in what they learn and what they can do with what they learn. That's very important. And they think about what's missing. What do they still need to work on? So now they're thinking about the material, and they're thinking about what they can do, perhaps as independent learners, to go a step, a step further. I use these, mostly the exit card, also for assigning an, intention, an attendance and participation rate. This is really important, because I used to be very troubled by the way I used to assign attendance and participation, which was, Oh, Margarita always raised her hand and she was very pleasant towards me. Every time I asked a question, she was there to help me out. And Felipe was very, well, I don't know what he was. He was shy or whatever it was, but he never contributed to class. It's kind of arbitrary, right? I mean, and for all I know, Margarita may be very fluent and extrovert, and Felipe may be a very good student, but he's very shy. And so it's just not a very good way to assign an attendance and participation grade. The exit card is about as objective a way as there can be of assigning an attendance and participation rate. Everybody participates in the exit card. And for formative assessment, and that's the next topic I'm getting to. Assessment, I'm gonna to have to go very quickly because I'm running out of time. Um, how much time do I have? Five minutes, okay. I can do this, I can do this. So, you know, we talk a lot, and, and as teachers, we like, we are experts at the last, summative assessment, which is what happens at the end, we give a grade. That's what helps us give a grade. If you are into heritage language learner, uh, heritage languages, you are very interested also in diagnostic testing. What do you know? Because you use what, that kind of information to place students. Formative, however, typically is neglected in, the, in, the language, in language teaching. And that's what I want to get to very quickly. Formative assessment is assessment that happens not to give a grade, but for you as a teacher to learn what you need to do to change your teaching or what you need to emphasize so that you will get your students to learn that enduring knowledge. So to adapt your teaching as it's ongoing. And for learners to know what they're not learning, what they're not getting, so they can take action. They can go to the center and take action and, and, and improve their chances of meeting the standards of the course. So, and there, that's what I just said. So what do I use for formative assessment? Well, the aha card, when I see what students pick out as interesting, I go, oh, that was a point that they found interesting. The oral quiz, which is what I just did with you guys. Okay, and you guys we did not participate. <laughs> I said, okay, this activity, one, two, three, or four. Right away, I always
always force my <laughs> I always force my students to do it, and I know right away. Oh, you know what? This question is problematic because half the class is giving me the wrong number. Or you know, I ask them to do true false on these little cards they hold up. But I force everybody, as opposed to who knows the answer? Is this true or false? Then Margarita's always up there with the hand, and everybody else is relying on her. No more. Right now, everybody has to answer. I say on the count of three, hold it up, and everybody has to answer. That gives you a very good idea of whether students are understanding or not. And then the KWL chart, what I know, what I want to learn, what I learned is similar to that other chart I showed you. Finally, grades. Grades are a big issue because, think about it, if you only have one class and you're telling students to go to that class, so you have, you might have an advanced bilingual school abroad who's in that class, a typical HL learner is the way we describe them, and a receptive bilingual, one who only understands but can't produce, and you put them in that class, because that's what your placement test told you to do, if you are not, if you don't think very hard about how to grade them, you create a situation that dooms some students to get an F, or C, or D, whatever, and other students guarantees that they will get an A. So you've got to be clever about how to do this. It's not fair um, to give them all, to grade them all the same way. On the other hand, it's not fair to change that either, so that's the trick. So here's how I've learned to do it over the years. First of all, I have many, many, many components. By the end of the semester, they have something like 60 things they will have done. All right? So these students that come in here and they're going to take it easy, not really. Because you're going to have to do 60 activities at the end of the semester. Every week you're doing you know, five, six activities. You should see the, I, I can show you my syllabi. I've I, I got a lot of stuff, right? Some components I grade holistically because I just want to get a feel. And I also don't want to get students bogged down and I don't get it. So I grade check or, or no check, right? <coughs> Others are graded on a discrete point basis. So this way students who are struggling a little bit, they can get a good grade on the holistic stuff, right? Mm -hmm. They have a chance that they do enough holistic stuff, they're learning, but they're also improving their grades as they go along. Some components have a redo option. That's a really important part of differentiated teaching. Sometimes some things you just gotta let them redo. Now I have 40 students, I don't know about you, but I don't enjoy grading. Things. That's what I let the computer do. That's what I do on Blackboard. That's, so all the activities are on Blackboard. The computer grades them, assigns them a grade, they try it again, etc. Most components serve as formative assessment. They help me understand what they don't get or what they get, and they help them understand what they don't get or get, right? The formative assessment are low stakes. They don't count much for the grade. They're just there to help the student understand, get a map of where they are relative to where they need to be, right? And then in my class, lower stake items preview higher value items. So the whole book exercises and online exercises preview the quizzes which are in class. The quizzes are worth 10 points. The quizzes preview the tests which are worth 50 points. So everything builds on everything else, right? This is what it looks like. Lower stake is formative. And it's the, the stuff that's either graded holistically or that it has a redo option. Medium stakes, it doesn't count for a lot of the grade. It's done in class and it's been previewed by low stake items. And finally, the high stakes items, the ones that count a lot for the grade, come at the end of all this preparation. So everybody has a chance to do well. They've had an opportunity to catch up. Okay, so in conclusion, if I have to sum up this whole thing, is keep your eye on the learner. That is, think of, conceive your teaching as being learner-centered, right? And three elements of enduring knowledge here for this presentation. HL teaching is learner-centered teaching. And why is that? Because HL learners present a wide range of abilities, as we saw. And the tools and strategies of differentiated teaching are what you need to implement. You can't have one size fit all teaching when you have here the other language learners involved. Second bit of information, curriculum and syllabus design needs to be, needs to make sense, right? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, no, this is identify two general orientations, language and the effective domain. You need to target those two things, right? And third, Oh, but you need to build in additional pathways. Sorry. 
and program designing, as well as curriculum design, should make linguistic and demographic sense. Don't conceive of HL teaching as whatever is not L2 teaching. Define it in the positive. By that I mean consider the elements that go into HL teaching and build courses that make sense, that target those elements. And I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. I know these uh, afternoon workshops and all, it's getting you during an already hard work day to kind of take more time out of your schedule. You know, as I was sitting here listening to the bits and pieces and these talks, what I find it, have found for the last two years so interesting about the work in the Texas Language Center and other places around the university setting is that you listen and you say, we came here together to talk about heritage <coughs> language teaching and we learned about that and we learned about looking at our students, and we learned about formative assessment, and we looked about alternative ways of structure in our classes and our syllabi and so forth, and that's what it's all about. It's coming in with this purpose that's very narrow and realizing that what we've actually done has expanded what we're doing tremendously. So I'm very grateful to our speakers this afternoon and to you. As always, the materials that you heard and saw today will be on the website of the Texas Language Center, so you can always go back and refer to those, as well as contact information for our speakers. If you have any questions, follow up, and so forth, please do check out our website and look at our coming events for November, those that I outlined, and please, 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 in your little packets when you came in, there's a short little quick um, uh, assessment, speaking of assessment, a summative assessment sheet, summative assessment sheet about this uh, particular uh, presentation. This helps us largely in planning for future presentations and also helps us tremendously in trying to secure outside funding so we can keep our events open and free to the public. Thank you once again, yes, and if you please join me in thanking our two wonderful speakers. Uh, thank you. Thank you.